Hello everybody. One of the things that I learned in the Rhodesian Army, and I hope I learned it well, was that uh, no person knows it all. There's always an opportunity of learning something new, something fresh, and uh, hopefully that one is a, a better individual for it afterwards. And so here we were one day. We had been sent to a village to investigate a feeding. I arrived there, I spoke to the headman. Uh, he told me that a group of Gandangas had arrived there in the early hours of the previous evening and they had demanded some fresh meat. Um, so a, a goat was slaughtered, um, it was cooked and uh, these people ate and eventually left oh, probably sometime he says between 10 and 11 o'clock. So this was this was good for us, it was mid-morning now so they they weren't that far ahead of us and we had every expectation that if we just shook a leg and got on with it and um, we might uh, be fortunate and before the end of the day uh, make contact with this bunch of insurgents and so we set out but I have to just uh, <clears throat> perhaps mention that one of the items of Rhodesian kit that I had uh, mixed feelings about was the radio set. Oh, it was a wonderful comfort to have it, of course. Uh, we were always told, and I've no reason to believe that this wasn't true, that no matter where you were, within the boundaries of Rhodesia, if you got hit in an ambush or by a landmine or, or, or anything like that, and uh, you were injured, uh, you would be uplifted and safely in the hands of expert medical care uh, within the space of 20 minutes to half an hour. But that presupposed, of course, that you had a radio that was working properly and that you had a radio operator or, or a stick leader who knew exactly where he was. And also, of course, that uh, there were no gooks immediately around you that uh, could bring the chopper down when he came in to uh, do the Kazavak. Um, so the radio was was a very, very useful thing to have. And, uh, and in that sense, it was an important part of our kit. But when you're doing follow-ups, I didn't find it so much of a comfort at all. Uh, and, and why I had reservations about it was that, that, that it seemed to be so noisy. Um, you see, you had a, a, a part of the radio was a, a called a telehand. And it was like an old telephone receiver and it would be, you'd hook it into your webbing and it would be there right hissing away in your ear hour after hour while you're walking through the bush. And I hated it because the sound to me seemed so loud that I felt that everybody nearby in the bush, any gooks lying in ambush or resting up somewhere would just hear this noise. And uh, of course, there's a volume control on the radio set, so you can turn this down so that it is quite quiet. But still, it, it even quite quiet sounded to me very loud. Um, there was also a facility uh, known as Squelch, and you could turn the switch, put it on Squelch, and that static hiss would disappear. But oh man, did it chew up batteries. Now what I used to do is, um, I would switch my radio on uh, first thing in the morning at first light while we were, you know, uh, in the platoon base camp. And while I was having breakfast or getting my kit together or cleaning my weapon, I would be listening with one ear uh, to, to the radio set. And uh, when reports came through to the ops tent uh, about feedings or incidents, um, I knew that we would be deployed uh, almost immediately. The lieutenant took the details down. So as soon as the report started coming in, I would just take the battery off the radio, the old battery, dump it, put a brand new fresh battery on, and now I'm ready to go. Um, I never took spares with me. It was just extra weight to carry. So I had one fresh battery on the radio set the minute that we uh, left the platoon base. And it was adequate. I mean, on, on very rare occasions, did we maybe go, uh, say, three days and two nights on a follow-up? 
it happened, but it, it didn't happen frequently enough to to create any concern in my mind regarding the, the, the battery. Usually it would be a day, maybe a day and a night on the spur and then part of the next day before we get recalled back to base camp. Um, so the battery would last that period of time. So I never really, um, I never really worried about uh, the battery running out, excepting if I had it on squelch. And if I had it on squelch, even that was a problem because uh, now I'm walking along in relative silence, shall we say, on, on the spur. And um, suddenly, unexpectedly, and it, it always startled me, uh, I'd suddenly hear something like, 1-1 uh, Alpha, 1-1 one, one Bravo, and it's loud. So my solution to to this whole problem with the radio <clears throat> and it's not a recommended solution by any means for anyone anybody in a wartime setting so i'll just turn the thing off and switch it off then i don't have to worry about any noise and i can concentrate on what i'm doing now you can imagine back at platoon base they need to speak to me or they they're curious they want to know how am i progressing with a follower and they can't get through there's no reply to their calls so um, they didn't like this very much but I felt safer and uh, and so I used to do that if I felt that we were you know so close to the gooks that a, uh, that a contact was imminent I would then switch on the radio try and move uh, to the rear a bit where my voice wouldn't be heard uh, and I would, you know, whisper a report back and, and tell people what was going on. But on this particular day, the radio is off and we're following the spoor. And I, I get to realize after a while that, man, these guys, are, we're moving along, but it seems like they're moving along as well. I don't see any resting places. And um, so they've now walked through the night. And they've walked up until the point where, where, where I am in, in the story and they still haven't stopped. So I'm beginning to think to myself, am I really going to catch these guys up? Because in a few hours time, the sun's going to go down. Uh, I'm going to have to stop again. I can't track at night. And if, if maybe they're going to continue for a few hours into the dark and then they might settle down for three or four hours and have a bit of a break. And then they're going to push again. So... Tomorrow morning, I'm going to be even further behind than I am now. So these thoughts are going through my mind and I'm beginning to wonder, is there any point in continuing with this thing? So I thought I'd better switch on the radio, stop, just, uh, you know, send a report. When I switch the radio on, <coughs> the Sunray, the lieutenant, has been trying to get hold of me. So he wants to know what's going on. And I, I, I tell him, look, I'm still on the spoor, I, you know, I'm following it, but it's, it's looking more and more as I'm falling behind you. So he says, I want you to leave that, okay, and I want you to move to another position. And uh, there's a call sign there, and they think they may have seen some gooks in the vicinity. So I want you to go to a certain place, and it's on the side of a, of a nearby hill. So uh, I am not, I, I'm, I'm not too convinced about what he's telling me because I have walked past that hill not so long ago and um, there's been no indication of other gooks in the area or any spoor leading across the spoor that I'm following. And I, you know, just, it just seemed so implausible to me that there could be gooks there. So... I'm thinking, all right, look, there's not much chance that I'm going to catch these guys, but there is still a little bit of a chance. I can't abandon this poor right now. It's still a little bit too early in the day. Uh, what if I go on another half hour and I find a resting place? Maybe they've, maybe they've stopped there for a few hours, in which case, you know, the whole dynamic changes and now everything is possible. I might still be able to hit them before nightfall. So I don't want to leave this poor. And I... I try and explain this to the lieutenant. He don't want to hear anything about this. Leave what you're doing and get to that position there. 
and then I'll tell you what to do when you get there. So uh, I, I do this with great reluctance and, uh, and not with much urgency, I say to my shame. Anyway, we leave the spoor and now we go. There's the gormal. It's uh, on my right hand side slightly to my rear we turn we go there now i've got to i've got to climb up the south slope of this hill move around to the eastern side of it and then i must stop there now there's a call sign situated on the top of that hill and they've been uh, on observation duties and i i happen to know the sunray of that call sign in fact, we worked together in Civvy Street for the same company. We walked, worked alongside each other. And like uh, many men in 5RR, he too was an ex-RLI uh, troopy who had uh, served his time, um, got, a, got a job, and then found himself called up to serve in 5RR. So uh, we knew each other very well, and he was up there. So um, if he thought there were gooks in the area, well, <clears throat> one couldn't dismiss it lightly. Um, but where were these gooks? And I mean, I don't know, when he reported this uh, to the lieutenant, I'd had the radio off for quite a while. So, you know, that may have been a couple of hours ago that he said this. And uh, two hours, the gooks can be very far away, if in the first place there ever were gooks there. Anyway, I'm going to make my way over to the east side of this hill and then we're going to see what happens. So we're ambling along. Nobody's killing themselves. Uh, partly because the bush is very dense. Um, visibility is down probably between 20 and uh, 30 meters. Uh, beyond that it's just undergrowth. So we're walking along. And I'm still, my mind is still back on the spur there, wondering idly to myself, how far were we behind these people in reality? When the next minute, firefight breaks out. Whoa, so close, right on my left hand side. Uh, I, for a moment, thought that we had walked into an ambush. It was so loud, but... Um, there were no rounds coming our way, none at all, although it wouldn't have surprised me uh, had I heard that. Um, and then it stopped. Just a few seconds. These things never seem to go on for, for very long. A few seconds, bush of silence. Nothing. So we're all standing there frozen. I can't move forward or I can't move to my left because I don't know what's going on there. Uh, if my buddy with his call sign are sweeping through the bush there <coughs> or advancing into a contact and I suddenly appear there amongst them could end up getting pulled myself and my guys so we wait to hear what's going on I get back to the platoon base I report that I've heard the sound of a contact he's also uh, my friend has now also come up contact contact and I can see that he's very very near to me so um I leave him and the lieutenant to talk about what's going on. Uh, no casualties either side. And the gooks have now run down the east side of the hill where I am supposed to be with my men acting as a stop group. But I'm nowhere near that. So um, the gooks get away. I meet up with my friend, we talk a little bit, go down to the road, we wait for the vehicles to come from the platoon base to come uplift us, uh, we get back to camp. Uh, the lieutenant calls me to one side and, uh, and I'm, I'm feeling very bad about it all. And he just says these words to me, if you had listened to me and uh, done what I told you to do, uh, we would have had some kills today. And I said, yes, sir, I'm, I'm very sorry. 
and I was. And that, that's all he said. I think he, he knew me well enough to know that uh, I had learned that lesson. And he hoped and I hoped that I wouldn't repeat it again. Um, so that has been a, a, a big regret for me uh, as I think back on my, my military career that on that occasion I should have acted more like a soldier and, um, and uh, obeyed immediately when I was given an order and um, I, I think that the results would have been very good. You know, I um, I was very good friends with our platoon commander, the lieutenant, and I uh, were very close, and not just in the army, between call-ups, uh, we would see each other, and uh, we have been more or less in correspondence uh, continually with, with each other uh, for many years, up until quite recently. I hadn't seen him for probably, I don't know, 30 odd years I suppose um, but he came out to to South Africa just before the COVID uh, pandemic uh, broke out uh, he and his good wife and I had the good fortune to to meet with them and you know <clears throat> the Rhodesian bond of brotherhood uh, is something that runs very deep and so it was a it was an emotional reunion lots of hugs and tears um, but while I was talking to him this incident again you know came up in my mind and uh, and uh, I he didn't mention it we in fact we didn't speak very much about the war at all but I, th I thought <laughs> so if you mention it I, I just want to uh, say again to you that uh, that I was I was sorry but it never came up um, but I know he watch <laughs> he watches my movies, so he's listening to me now, uh, and I, I would say to him, I can give you a promise that if ever those circumstances are repeated again, and you and I find ourselves in the same situation, I promise you, sir, I will listen to you emphatically. I will obey you. <laughs> you know what, Rob? What rubbed salt into my wounds after that was when we got to the end of that call up. Um, the company saw a major came to me with a whole lot of bits of piece of paper in his hand and he said hey <clears throat> you got to sign this before you can demob I said what is all this he said it's all your lost kit I said, my lost kit I've never lost any kit in my life I don't lose anything what have I lost he said you lost the compass so where did I lose the compass he said when you were on the side of that gomo in a place where you shouldn't have been. That's when you lost it. I said, I didn't lose it. He said, no, but somebody else lost it in the platoon. And, you know, if you lost any kit, you know, the Rhodesian army was strict about this. You paid for it. And a compass was an expensive item of equipment. So here he was with slips of paper, guys that have lost compasses and binos and water bottles and goodness knows what else, all booked to me. Because, you see, um, <laughs> If it's lost in the contact, that's free of charge. You don't pay for it. So uh, it seemed that from that call up onwards, everybody that lost stuff, <laughs> it was all debited to me. And you know, I don't know if there are any archives left in, in that country, but if somebody had to go through Rhodesia Regimental archives, <laughs> come across my service record, they will say to themselves, Man, what a careless soldier. <laughs> he must have thrown half of the Rhodesian army's equipment away. <laughs> so I think that was a little bit of a punishment for me. But anyway, uh, I, I, I'm happy to have been able to help out in that way, if in not many other ways. Yeah, so I, I, I think I learned something new about myself there, that I should be... Uh, more compliant and not uh, uh, not exhibit uh, too much of an independent spirit uh, as I had up until that point. But anyway, folks, thank you very much for listening. Um, keep well. Um, I trust that um, you'll all be safe uh, through these difficult times that we are living for and everybody's talking about them becoming even uh, more difficult. 
But um, look after yourselves. And God bless you all. And cheers for now.